everybody. This is Darren Van Dam, and you are listening to the Flick Connection Podcast, episode 19. Not quite made it to 20 just yet. Uh, maybe I'll do something special next week for 20. In fact, the plan is to have my first guest next week. Uh, believe it or not, the date has been set, and as long as there are no uh, technical issues, uh, scheduling issues with the first guest, um, we will have a... A guest I'm very, very excited about next week. Somebody that's in a lot of very good movies. Um, not necessarily a name you will recognize, but nonetheless, they're going to be very, very interesting to talk to. And uh, that is the type of person I really want to have on this show. Uh, uh, actors like that that are just in a lot of really cool projects. They've got a lot of stories to tell. Uh, filmmakers uh, on smaller projects just have, you know, so, so many interesting things to share that you're not really going to get anywhere else. So that's what I'm hoping to bring you over the next year. And next week might be the first step. But this week, we're going to talk about uh, the fact that Captain Kirk's dick is going to be on Netflix in a couple of months. So ladies might get excited about that and, and some of the men. It's 2018. Uh, going to talk about some of the you know, awards season. I've bashed the Oscars enough on this show. I'm not going to do that here. Uh, the good thing about awards season and the fact that a lot of studios put their, their most award-worthy movies out at the end of the year means we get a lot of really good movies in a very short amount of time. There are some trailers getting released for some very good-looking movies. I'm going to talk about some of the ones I'm most excited about, uh, including one that might be the next There Will Be Blood. Um, I'm anticipating I'm not necessarily going to like it as much because one of the reasons I like There Will Be Blood so much is I like the setting. But there's a movie that looks like it's going to have it's got some got some potential uh, the Tarantino Star Trek project and no that doesn't have anything to do with Captain Kirk's dick those are two completely unrelated stories uh, Jordan Peele's third project possibly the next it chapter two and Burt Reynolds we're going to talk a little bit about Burt Reynolds uh, and the tail end of this episode uh, if you don't know Burt passed away just this past week. He was 82. Um, so we're going to talk about just some of his better movies, uh, him, uh, what I like about him, um, and then we'll, you know, some. We'll, we'll see what we have time for. We'll see what we have time for. But let, let's get into some of these uh, uh, upcoming movies. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the Netflix originals like I did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, if you missed that episode... I believe that was episode 17, and I, one of the movies I talked about was Outlaw King, which stars Chris Pine, who is Captain Kirk. Uh, apparently, he's full frontal nude uh, in that movie. It's going to be on Netflix, and there's a lot of blood in that movie. All of Chris Pine is in that movie, which is interesting because you really don't get, like, a list. I think Chris Pine's A list. If he's not, he's like B plus list. Male actors going full frontal nude. You know, Brad Pitt supposedly was going to do it for uh, the Jesse James movie, and they cut it. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if it somehow gets cut out of this movie as well, and they just use it to sort of uh, uh, for some PR. But anyway, I thought that was noteworthy. It, it's not something that happens a lot outside of Game of Thrones. Um, Roma, I also talked about that, um, and I'm not, trust me, this is the last one, I'm not rehashing all of the uh, Netflix originals, but Roma is a Netflix original directed by Alfonso Cuaron, who did Children of Men, Gravity, uh, it's his next movie, it's black and white, takes place in Mexico City, looks just absolutely beautiful, uh, it won the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival. So it looks like a contender for award season. Uh, and then I'll move on. So I, I mentioned briefly, I saw a trailer for A Star is Born, which is uh, directed by Bradley Cooper. And if you haven't noticed Bradley Cooper, outside of uh, playing Rocket Raccoon in Guardians of the Galaxy, Bradley Cooper has been gone from movies you know american sniper was huge for him not just because he got nominated for every award under the sun and you know the movie did as well um but he 
uh, did not get paid for that movie. He took a percentage of the the box office take uh, in order to be in it, and that movie did way better than anybody anticipated. So, um, you know, Bradley Cooper is a multimillionaire to the extent that, for for, for such a young actor, uh, to the extent that he can basically just do whatever he wants now with his life. And he's always wanted to direct, even before getting into acting. He I guess saw himself as a director. That's what he wanted to do with movies. And he's always wanted to direct this movie, A Star is Born, which I didn't realize at first. This is the fifth iteration of A Star is Born. It might have gone under a different title once or twice, but it's the same story. So it's it's remake after remake from the early days of cinema. This is the latest iteration. Bradley Cooper's directed it. And I said this a couple of weeks ago when I talked about the trailer. This does not look like my kind of movie. The cinematography in this is gorgeous. And I I don't just mean like it's artsy. Like, the movie looks beautiful. Like, just the way it's shot. Like, the color and the detail. And, like, it really just looks like like you could just watch it on mute. Like, I mean, it's that good looking. Uh, Lady Gaga's in it, which... I could really care less. I don't have any like ill feelings towards Lady Gaga. I just not not a fan for any particular reason. But um, you know, I've seen her act in a couple of things. She seems like she might actually have some chops. Uh, and Cooper plays a musician, um, and then he he basically meets her and convinces her that she needs to be a musician as well, and he sort of like fosters her and sort of turns her into the star. That is the like layout of the story. It's like a love story, a success story, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, it just looks so good. And then, let's see. The look, so t- talking about the look, I, was, I started looking up things about this movie. The look, Cooper says that the look is based off of a Metallica concert that he saw like when he was in sixth grade. And I'm not sure which one that is, but I think I've seen it too. I just can't remember the name of it. Uh, I had a friend that would like had all of them and we'd hang out at his house and we'd watch them. And I think I know which one he's talking about. And the interesting thing about that is that uh, the drummer for Metallica, Lars Ulrich, Ulrich, I think it's Ulrich. Uh, yeah, I believe it's Ulrich. Uh, actually filmed... Uh, one of the live performances that they did, and Lady Gaga convinced Cooper that both of them should sing live. So he took vocal training, so it's actually him singing, of course it's her singing, but there's a bunch of live performances uh, in the movie itself, and uh, apparently it's all live singing. So it's, it's an interesting project, especially since it's one, like I said, it's not really one I would normally be interested in, it looks so good that I'm probably going to want to see it, maybe even in the theater, which is kind of, it's just an odd movie for me to want to go see in the theater, but I'm telling you, it looks that good, and it's being received really well. It's getting very, very good reviews as it's sort of making its little festival circuit, but it comes out in like just a few weeks. Uh, the Favorite looks like, I mentioned a new There Will Be Blood, The Favorite looks like the new There Will Be Blood is directed by Yorgos Lattimos. I'm, I'm probably not putting the right emphasis on that. But he did, I've talked about some of his movies recently. He most recently did The Killing of a Sacred Deer. And then before that, The Lobster, both starring Colin Farrell. And then before that, a movie I really liked, it was several years ago, called Dog Tooth. Uh, it's foreign language. But this one, the favorite, it stars Rachel Weiss. Uh, Emma Stone, and it's about these women essentially sort of like um, uh, pining for the favor of the queen. They like live in the palace with different roles or whatever. I, I didn't quite pick up on all that, but they're like battling each other for the favor of the queen. And it kind of reminds me of There Will Be Blood in the, the, the plain view and the, you know, fighting the evangelical preacher. You've got these two women at odds that are really going at it. And then uh, Yorgos, his directing style is very offbeat, very odd, almost uncomfortable to watch, but very, very good. And so this one looks really interesting. It looks like it's got some grim, grim elements to it, but it looks like one I'll definitely be watching. So the favorite, keep your eyes peeled for that one. 
And then another director I like, who I've talked about recently on the main channel, I've recommended some of his movies on Netflix, uh, The Sisters Brothers is a postmodern western. It comes out in just a couple weeks. It comes out in September. It's called The Sisters Brothers, and it stars Joaquin Phoenix and John C. Riley. Uh, and it's the director of A Rust and Bone, which I just recommended recently. It is on Netflix. You can watch it now. I highly recommend that movie. And a really, really good prison movie called A Prophet. Now, I have wanted to include A Prophet on one of my typical Netflix lists, like, a, like or, or even just a streaming list about prison movies, because I think it is one of the best and most underrated prison movies I've ever seen. I never hear anyone talk about this movie. I know I'm getting sort of sidetracked, but I've got to talk about this movie. It's foreign language mostly, so it's French, I believe. It's called A Prophet. Track this movie down. If you're in the mood to rent something, pay a few bucks uh, to see a really good uh, prison flick. Uh, this one is up there. You know, I want to include, maybe I just need to do a list. The only problem is, anytime I've done lists of movies just to talk about them, and they're not like readily available on streaming services, the video just doesn't get very good views, which is kind of one of the many reasons I, I started this podcast, so I could just talk about any movie I want, and I don't feel restricted by what's going to get views on YouTube. But again, let me let me gush about the prophet for a little bit, and then we'll get back to the sisters brothers because the sisters brothers is going to be English language, uh, or, or let me just knock that out real quick because I don't have a lot to say about it because I haven't seen it. But I mean, we haven't seen John C. Riley in a really serious role in a long time, but he's always great at that. The movie looks like it's a little bit funny, but it's there. There are like two outlaws. Like it looks, it looks good. I'm a I'm a sucker for westerns. And this looks like it's going to be different. So keep your eyes open for The Sisters Brothers in a couple of weeks. I think it's going to be great. But this director, I don't know, of course I don't have his fucking name. Uh, one of his early movies, A Prophet. Man, there's nobody... I'm sure, I'm sure they're famous in France. But as far as uh, you know, American audiences go, there's nobody to speak of in this movie. But you know, I put it up there with, with prison movies like... Yeah, I don't want to say Shawshank Redemption because that's PG-13, but like Midnight Express, uh, really good prison movies. Like Midnight Express and this one would both be like t really towards the top of the list, maybe top three, four. Both of those would be in there. I'm sure I'm forgetting something. Uh, but it's so good, and it, it sort of tells the story of a uh, young guy thrown into prison who at first sort of unwittingly starts to work his way up the ladder of uh, organized crime from within prison. Uh, I just really, I've only seen it once because it was on Netflix and then it went away. As soon as I see it's back on a streaming service, I'm gonna, you know what, fuck it, I'm just gonna buy it. I, I, I've been thinking about this movie for years. I probably saw it four years ago and I keep thinking about it. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna maybe, maybe I'm just gonna talk about prison movies um, in an upcoming a podcast because I really have some good ones like this that I want to talk about that you just can't you can't get them on streaming services so I know people aren't going to watch it on on the main YouTube channel but here you at least get to find out about some really good movies you should watch so if that sounds like something you'd be into let me know in the comments on YouTube and then the one I'm excited for I've not even seen a trailer it's not out yet as soon as there's a trailer I'm going to be talking about this one Destroyer Stars Nicole Kidman. It's a neo noir detective thing. It looks kind of gritty, grungy, kind of uh, white trash. Kind of like she's kind of a trashy looking character from the images I've seen. She's next to an old beat up pickup truck. She looks dirty, uh, but she's like a detective of some sort, or a retired detective, or something like it's. There's there's vague details, but it's from the same director. And the reason I like to sh first off, the reason I like to share like the same director as. Because when it's a, a director of a movie I really liked, it's an indication that this will, movie will be good too. Doesn't always mean that's the case, but it's it's the best signal you can get that you're going to like a movie is if you've liked that director's previous work, especially if you like that director's previous work a lot, and especially if that movie or movies really are successful and you like them because they were well directed, not because of other factors. Um, but she, this director of Destroyer, did 
uh, The Invitation, which is on Netflix, which I love that movie. Really, really good movie. If you have not seen it, I highly recommend it. Good little mystery movie about a guy who goes to a dinner party at his ex-wife's house and the the people there have this really weird vibe, this culty thing they're involved in and he starts to really start to think something's wrong, something nefarious is going on, you know, under the skin and he can't figure out if he's being paranoid or if something really is happening. It's really, really, and, and just think about that type of story. It has to be really well di uh, directed. Uh, that's the only way something like that's going to be successful and work. So, apparently, Destroyer, from what people are saying, you know, early preliminary, uh, you know, from festival runs and stuff, is that it's really incredible. It's currently on IMDb. It says December twenty fifth. I'm going to be kind of surprised if that's going to be a, if it doesn't sound like a Christmas movie release because it's not a big movie. Um, but they probably are going to do a limited release before the end of the year so it can be eligible for awards uh, because that's how stuff works. Excited, excited for that one. Okay, so that is it as far as the ones that are uh, looking like they're going to uh, really kind of be important in award season. There, there will be more, but right now these are the ones that are grabbing my attention. Um, apparently... This uh, Quentin Tarantino Star Trek movie is a real thing. Uh, it was kind of rumored. Well, it wasn't rumored. It was confirmed that he did go have a meeting with J.J. Abrams a few months ago. And J.J. Abrams liked it. And they moved the ball forward. But a lot of time has passed. And Tarantino's finishing up uh, his, his next movie, which will be out relatively soon. I think it'll be out. I, I, I say relatively soon. I think it's like 12 months from now. But it's like a Hollywood murder uh, movie that's coming, you know, coming out next year. Um, so that's his next project. But apparently, the ball is continuing to move forward on this Star Trek movie, and apparently, it is going to be rated R. It sounds like it's going to be the the third installation of the current franchise because, uh, or no, they already had three. I'm sorry, but it sounds like it's still going to be an extension of the current franchise because Carl Urban is on deck. It sounds like he's going to be using the same cast. Um, and it... <coughs> excuse me. I knew that was going to happen. Uh, just getting over being sick, and I'm really trying to suppress the coughs here. Um, Carl Urban, uh, who I really like. I like everything he's in. If you're, if you're not familiar with him, he played... You, you are familiar with him, but he played Dread. He, he played Judge Dread in the last Dread movie. Um, I can't... <laughs> He, he, he's been in a bunch of stuff, but he's in Star Trek. I think he kills it in those movies. I, I really like I, I like him a lot as an actor. He's saying from what he understands, he knows some details about uh, what Tarantino is wanting to do with Star Trek. Apparently, it's not going to be just like riddled with uh, profanity. It's not going to have the typical dialogue of a Tarantino movie. It'll probably have strong dialogue, but it's not going to necessarily have that witty, filthy kind of banter that he would normally have. Because it doesn't really fit on brand with Star Trek, but when someone dies, uh, it's going to be gruesome. Uh, the way he put it, like if someone gets sucked out, you know, through a vacuum, you're going to see their guts, you know, get ripped out or you know stuff like that. Uh, that's probably not a specific thing. I think he's probably just speculating. But uh, from what he understands, is it's going to be rated R more so that they can show the consequences of uh, the the. The, the catastrophe of like dying in space uh, so I'm, I'm on board I mean I, Tarantino is yet to really let me down obviously I like some of his movies less than others but you know when you compare them to other Tarantino movies yeah I can say ah oh, it's not as good as that one or whatever but still when you compare them to like just other movies in general um, he does a great job of like adapting stuff taking something finding like the spirit of it <coughs> excuse me Taking something uh, original, finding the spirit of it, why people love it, and then playing with that in a really great way. That's what he's good at. Some people like to go, oh, he rips everything off. No, yes, he does recycle it, but he's very successful at that. He knows what he's doing with that. And so I think him getting a franchise like this, I would have never thought of it, but it makes perfect sense. 
Uh, speaking of uh, you know, a good director taking over a franchise, Jordan Peele, he's got a new movie coming out in the spring, I believe. I believe this spring. Uh, but he's talking about, um, he, he's kicking around the idea of doing a Candyman reboot. I love that idea. One, I really like the original Candyman. Two, I think Jordan Peele could do a good job with it. Um, he does a good job sort of understanding and playing with race in movies in a way that other people are not. Um, I've had issues with the way other people have handled like racism in movies where it seems almost like they play with stereotypes too much and they, they sort of just like are, are really clumsy with it. Whereas Jordan Peele, with Get Out at least, we'll see if he was a, if it was a fluke and whether or not he can maintain it with his next movie. But he's got a really sophisticated take on uh, racism, and he does a very good job of laying it out and presenting it on film without having to explain everything through exposition. The, move, the story is able to unveil things. So I think that's what made Get Out so good. And Candyman, you know, the original, it, it, it uh, really revolved, it, or at least took place within the projects. Uh, so there's a lot of, like, potential, uh, you know, for him to, like, play with new and interesting ideas revolve, uh, revolving racism in America with this horror uh, reboot. And horror reboots are the it thing right now. And, and even if you hate on reboots, they are... Horror reboots are some of the best reboots across all genres right now. I mean, action reboots typically suck. Uh, you know, there's exceptions, but... You know, reboots, I'm not a fan of. Uh, they're never as good as the original, but, like, it was fantastic. Suspiria's coming out. Not only does it look amazing, uh, they're saying it's amazing. Um, what's it? There's another one that they're remaking. Um, Candyman's one that was on... on oh, man, what is that other one? I, I, it'll pop into my head in the middle of the show. Uh, or the middle of the rest of the show. But there's some exciting looking horror remakes coming out. Candyman could be one of them. I think if he does it, it would really be done right. Um, and then speaking of you know remakes, It Chapter 2. Uh, from what I understand, fans of the books, they're, they're leaking details as to what's going to be included, what's not going to be included. They're filming it currently. It comes out next year. Uh, but fans are apparently really excited about some of the leaks that are coming out, details that are going to be in the movie. I'm not going to spoil any of those here because they definitely are spoilers, but that's exciting to hear. And they got a killer cast. for the, So Chapter 2, if you don't know, uh, is going to be the kids grown up. So it's going to fast forward. Uh, does it go full 30 years or like 20 years or 25 years? There's an exact number. You know, geeks of the movie, lovers of the movie are going to know what that number is, but there's an exact number. Anyway, fast forward, let's say 25 years. Because Pennywise goes away and he comes back. He has like a cyclical thing. He has this cycle he goes through. Um, and that's how the miniseries did. The first half was kids, the second half was adults. So chapter two is going to be adults. Jessica Chastain... Uh, is in it, James McAvoy, uh, Isaiah Mustafa, if that name sounds familiar, he is the uh, Old Spice guy, the guy with the towel, uh, black guy, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I've not ever seen him in anything, but it's he's an interesting choice, and then there's some other faces that I've recognized and I've liked in things, but nobody as famous as uh, Chastain or McAvoy, uh, so that's interesting. Um, same writer, same director, so it, it should be really good. So I'm excited for all of that. Um, I'm going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about Burp. So as I mentioned, Burt Reynolds passed last week, and as is customary, whenever somebody really famous like that dies, uh, that's the time everybody decides to talk about them. I personally don't really like that custom, um, but it does make sense. Like 
there was no real reason for me to talk about Burt Reynolds a couple weeks ago. I easily could have talked about everything I'm going to talk about right now. It would have been fine. It would have been a little less interesting, number one. Less people would have cared. And number two, there's always something else to talk about. There's always something more pressing. And so when somebody dies, they're in the news. So it just makes sense to talk about them and kind of honor them at that time. Um, but me personally... Uh, I, I've been a fan of, of Burt Reynolds since I was a kid. Um, you know, Smokey and the Bandit, I remember watching it when I was, I don't know, man, probably second grade, probably seven or eight years old. Um, and it was just so cool. Like, I didn't really, you know, the, think about when you're at th that age, you have like a limited perspective on stuff. You've had, had, you've had not only limited life experiences, but even just the types of movies I'd seen were limited. And so images and, and concepts of what is cool uh, were, were limited at that point. There was only so many things, and there was really, I had not seen anything like Smoking the Bandit. One, because it was a little too old for me. Like it, not, not that the movie was too old, old, but it was a little too mature for that age. I'm, you know, not seven or eight is not the target demo for Burt Reynolds' uh, movies, but. Uh, in fact, I don't know that he ever did any kids' movies. Um, no, uh, Cop and a Half. Uh, but that, maybe that's it. If you can think of any other Burt Reynolds like kids' movies, like not just family-friendly, but like movies for kids, let me know in the comments. But he really didn't do that, which is also kind of cool. Um, but, you know, there's the types of movies he did. You know, he's got obviously a bunch of... Uh, well, I'm sorry. I, I'm scatterbrained today. Uh, let me stick with Smokey and the Bandit. Um, it was so cool, like obviously, you know, the Trans Am T-Top is cool as fuck, but just like he was just sort of laid back and just sort of like this cool character, kind of like a Steve McQueen kind of a thing, and, and we went, oh, and, you know, and he was maybe one of my first, like, uh, uh, movie stars to sort of see that way. It's like, oh man, he, so he's cool, like that's what cool is. Um, so that's kind of burned into my head. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what I want to do. Uh, I've had this idea for years. Um, I just don't have the means to do it. Maybe within a year I will have the means to do it. We're going to talk about uh, Smoking the Bandit Project. I'm super excited about uh, when I finish talking about some of his other movies. But he was just so cool. And, uh, you know, the cool thing about him is yeah, he's got, like, a lot of IMDb credits. But as far as, like, starring roles, he's got plenty. Don't get me wrong. But he wasn't, he's not been in like two movies a year like some actors. Like George Clooney's in like two movies a year. Burt Reynolds would kind of have like little gaps and stuff. You know, there was a period there where he was definitely in at least one a year. But he doesn't have that many starring roles. And then as he got older, they came more to be like cameo roles and stuff, which is understandable. He sort of like faded out of movies. But... He had some great ones in his older years as well. And they the thing about them is they all vary so much. So like don't forget forget don't forget about some of these. Like Deliverance. Not only was he cool as shit in that movie, and just like a a straight out badass, that is just a great, great movie. He stands out in it. Um you know, and then the, to be able to go from that to Smokey and the Bandit, where he plays this really kind of cool, laid-back guy. Um, and then as he gets older, Boogie Nights, I think it was a perfect, I think that was a genius, genius casting choice that most people would not have made. They wouldn't have thought, hey, let's make uh, Burt Reynolds this uh, porn producer. But not only did he do a great job, like it easily, easily could have been cheesy to put an old Burt Reynolds in that role. He did a great job with it, and really, you kind of, he wasn't an old um, bandit, you know? He was this different character, and I think he did a really great job with that. The great thing about that role is, yeah, he was kind of slimy, but he was also likable. Like, through the whole movie, he had, like, yeah, he was this porn producer, and there was a lot of drugs and casual sex and all this, you know, in his house. But there were times where you could see like he had like like this like moral code as well. Without him even saying anything, he was able to sort of like uh, display that. So he was great with that. 
And then just like comedically, you know, he was he was in a bunch of comedies, but striptease. A lot of people forget about that movie. It's not a great movie by any means, but he is hilarious in that movie. And then um, one a lot of people don't know about, it is on Amazon Prime right now. I need to include it in a list coming up soon. Uh, there's a movie called Gator. Oh, there goes a screaming kid in the background. That's not good. Um, I might have to go take care of that. Uh, but he plays uh, Gator McCluskey. He directed it. A lot of people don't know that. He directed a few movies. Gator is one of them. And it's kind of a cool Smokey and the Bandit kind of a thing. Uh, I'll probably talk more about that on the main channel. But again, that's on Amazon Prime. So those are all really... I mean, there's more to talk about. But those are some of my favorites. Let me know what your favorite Burt Reynolds movie is in the comments below. If you're on YouTube. Uh, and if you're, if you're not on YouTube... Definitely come over, check it out. You might like to, one, see what I look like, uh, see what my setup looks like, uh, so you know kind of what you're actually listening to if you're listening on the podcast. But you podcast listeners, God bless you. I really appreciate every single one of you. There's a handful more of you every single week, so thank you to any new listeners. But let me change the battery in this fucking camera. It does such a horrible job. I don't know why it doesn't have more bars than three. It just had two out of three, and now it's blinking red. So it's getting ready to die. I'm going to change that real quick. I will be right back. All right, and I'm back. And yes, I know I omitted The Longest Yard. I know I'll probably get a couple of complaints. I just happen to not really be a fan of that movie. I don't know. I just don't particularly like it. One reason might be because I saw the remake before the original. That always kind of ruins a movie whenever you do that. Um, you want to go in a time capsule, though? Go watch the first, like, two minutes of the original Longest Yard. Burt Reynolds is, like, slapping around a woman like it's his, like it's his, it's his job. Uh, and it's a comedy movie, and he's the hero of that movie. Uh, the, and you remember, that used to happen. Not just that that used to happen in real life, but that used to happen in movies. The woman got kind of smacked around a little bit, and it wasn't um, horrifying to see now it's just like jesus bert <laughs> but like i mentioned uh on the, the i might have even mentioned it here the movie i tanya the tanya harding thing with uh what's her face margot roby uh you know that movie's funny but then she's getting hit a lot in it and you're just like jesus like it's really like I mean, like, made me, like, wince, you know. But then you see Bert just slapping this bitch around in this movie. And it's just, it's not something you'll see anymore. Um, not with that sort of tone. Not without a, like, heavy domestic violence tone. Which, uh, that's a good thing. I'm not saying, like, we need to bring beaten up women in movies back. I'm just saying, you can go see it. And it's just an odd, like, relic uh, from the 70s that happened... A decent amount of movies. I just happen to know that it's in that movie. Um, to love Bert, it's just he's just you know. I, I don't know him obviously, but from what I understand, he was a really good sport about sort of the the uh, you know just people being fans and stuff like that. So that's always cool to find out that somebody's you know from what I understand fairly down to earth. I can't really speak to it because I didn't know him, but I, I do like to hear that you know because I I imagine being that famous. It, it, I would imagine it takes a great deal of effort to be that famous and to remain down to earth. I would imagine, and there's a lot of people that do it, but most don't. And I would imagine the ones that do, it, they really have to like reflect and, and center themselves and realize you know, kind of what their actual place is in the world because they are put on a pedestal and everyone's a yes man to them. And it, it would just be difficult to not just become just a, like, tyrannical asshole when you're that famous. So God bless anybody that is and does not. But something I've wanted to do for years is get a T-top. What, what, number one, I would love to own one. They have like new ones that they make. They're kind of hard to come by, but I would buy one. But I'd love to just rent one. Get the red shirt, belt buckle, cowboy hat with the, I believe, I believe he had like a rattlesnake band on it. Super tight jeans. I would do the whole, boots, I'd do the whole thing. Uh, was, and I, I wanted, I, now, my idea previously was not to fuck, completely suit up like that to the point of being uncomfortable, which that would be. Um, if you ever worn tight pants as a man, it is 
it's swampy and brutal, especially I live in Atlanta. Um, even just now, I'm getting, I'm getting chills just thinking about how horrible that would be. But my idea was just like, hey, let's rent, rent a sports car. Of course, at the time I had the idea, I had a Mustang. Uh, but let's let's get some sports cars, me and my friends, and we'll do the Smokey and the Bandit run. We'll go from Atlanta uh, to Texarkana, pick up beer, and come all the way back uh, as a road trip. Obviously, we'll stop you know a couple of times along the way, get some radar detectors, um, and not go d drive dangerously, but get on some nice open stretches and be able to kind of op open them up, you know. Um, I would love to do that. Now that I've got this Flick Connection thing that's really taken off on the main channel, it's starting to generate some revenue. Um, when I get to the point that that becomes, or this, that Flick Connection, the podcast and the main channel and everything, becomes a full-time gig, I want to take a week, really just like four days, five days, and do that run, film it, document it, Maybe put a couple of videos out about it. If that sounds like something you would like to see, uh, let me know. Uh, but I think that would be really fun for a couple of reasons. One, it's just be it would be nostalgic. It would be kind of silly, especially if I went, you know, the full full bore and 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 dress the part. I don't think we'd get like a. I'd I'd have to get a CB radio. Uh, that would be a must. Um, you got to have that if you're going to be doing that kind of stuff. I feel like I'd need somebody following me for filming purposes, but I, you know, you don't want to. It's not like I'm gonna have a big rig follow me, so I got to plan that out. But I feel strongly enough about it now, here today, that I can say with almost certainty that that is going to happen, unless this foot connection thing just falls apart and and I don't get a chance to do it. But that's you know, I, I I've always been a big fan of uh, of. Uh, a big fan. I can't even get the name of the show out. I'm a fan of Top Gear, and that's where I kind of got the idea. It was like, oh, we could do Smoking the Bandit. Plus, I'm I'm in this. I already live in the starting point. Um, I'd have to I'd have to come up with some more ideas to make it like more and more legit. Um, but that's gonna happen. We're gonna do that. You guys are gonna come with me. It's gonna be fun. Um, as I get more ideas on that, I will discuss them. But that is all I have for today. Um, I uh, traveled to uh, Mississippi this past weekend. Um, I'm filming this kind of late on Monday. It's going up early Tuesday. And I did do my research. I got a lot of research on all these new movies for you guys. But um, did not have enough time to flesh out the full hour. But uh, that's the price of you know going to see family. Because kind of talk about driving to Texarkana. Just driving down to South Mississippi from Atlanta with two... I can't even believe I'm talking about doing a road trip after just coming back from this this is fucking all day all day down there. Two kids in the car, one of them's five months old. A whole day in Mississippi, and I got to tell you, people, if I know I've got a couple of uh, listeners in Mississippi, so Atlanta is known for being hot. It's really hot here. I mean, it, it's it's. In the summer, it's typically up in the, the mid to high 90s, and it's humid. Now, I spent a fair amount of time out in Vegas uh, for work where it's well over 100 degrees because I'm always out in the goddamn summer. I'm always out in the summer. Um, but you don't sweat. I mean, you can if you get physical out there, but if you're just outside, you just feel like hot air on your body, but you don't sweat because there's like no humidity. Here, it's like 90% humidity. <laughs> And it is, you just you just sweat. You know, you can be outside at night when it's 80 degrees and you're going to, like, beat up. You're going to, in shorts and a t-shirt, and you're going to get balmy and sweaty. That's Atlanta. When I get out of the car in freaking South Mississippi, it is like the swamp. It is like, when I step out of the car, it's like stepping into a hotter car. That's how hot it is down there. And, you know, I used to be fairly acclimated to it. Like, when I was a teenager and in college, I worked outside. And, yeah, you sweat, but your your body gets comfortable with it. Now I go down there, I just cannot stop complaining about how freaking hot it is. And I don't even mean to be a complainer. It just comes out of my mouth because I'm so miserably, like, just hot and sweaty. It's so bad. I know if I move back down there, which I don't have any plans to, Mom. So don't don't take that the wrong way. 
But uh, if I ever did, I'm sure I would acclimate in a re reasonable amount of time. But if you've never been, it is so... You do not know what muggy is. I would imagine anyone like... Uh, South Louisiana, South Mississippi, all the way down the Florida coast, and then the panhandle of Florida. I would imagine everyone in that region know, really knows what muggy is. I would imagine it's all muggy. If anything, Miami is a little hotter. Of course, I've been to Miami, and it was hot, but it wasn't hotter. Um, those people know what hot and muggy is, and nobody else does. If you're just a... 30 miles north of the coast, you don't know what hot and muggy is, I'm telling you. Um, that's enough about that, though. Hopefully, uh, you enjoyed the show. Uh, let me know in the comments. Um, it's not that I'm running out of stuff, because hopefully i got some guests coming up, like I said. Um, in fact, you know, for you people who are uh, still listening here to the end of the show, I'll go ahead and tell you uh, who my guest is. Uh... Let me get his like IMDb up. But he is in... Um, let's see. Come on, man. That's what I get for not being like real, real ready. Um, let's see. He, is in, he was in The Sopranos. He was in uh, Boardwalk Empire. Um, there's a movie I really like with Patton Oswalt called Big Fan. Uh, he was his brother in that. Um... Now, where is he? Gino Caffarelli. Um, hopefully he didn't mind me sharing his name. I don't know why he would. He's going to be on the show soon. He's got a new movie coming out uh, just in a couple weeks called Cruise. Uh, it looks really good. It like takes place in the 80s, and it's kind of a summer love kind of thing, but it's about... It revolves around kind of a greaser guy that races cars, so that's kind of cool. He's in The Irishman. He plays Mayor Frank Rizzo. Uh, in The Irishman, which is Scorsese's next Scorsese's next movie, uh, which is going to be a Netflix original. Um, Fonzo is a movie, the title of a movie, where uh, uh, Tom Hardy is playing Al Capone, and it's directed by it's directed by the guy that did the uh, Chronicle. Um, so that should be interesting. And he he's uh, Gino has told me that uh, that that uh, Gonzo. Looks like it's really going to be something. Uh, so we're going to talk about all that. We're going to talk about his new movie, Cruise, which looks cool, which you're going to be able to see really soon. We're going to talk about what it was like to work with Scorsese, uh, what it was like to work on the Tom Hardy movie. We're going to do what I really want to do with this show, what I'm trying to get to, is so we're just going to talk movies. We're going to see how organic you know, that comes out. And, uh, you know, I, I can't wait to talk about some movies with him. I mean, Goodfellas being my favorite movie, this guy is like a, the perfect guest. So I, I'm fucking pumped about that. Again, as long as there are no technical issues, I've got a, you know, I, I'm here in Atlanta. He's in New York. We're going to do a Skype call. Hopefully the audio is good for a podcast. I know other people do that. So we're going to try to, I'm, I'm trying to get everything really working well for that. But I, I cannot wait to do that. Um, and then ultimately being in Atlanta, I don't know if you know this, it's one of the top filming locations in the country right now. So people like this are always in Atlanta. So eventually I'll be able to schedule around that. So this is actually a really good city for me to be in to do this type of stuff. So I'm working on it. I've got a couple other people in the hopper. Uh, Dan uh, Hagen from... Uh, uh, I had a hell of a time at House Harker. I, I'm sorry, I always say that wrong. I had a bloody good time at House Harker. Cool little vampire movie. I've talked about it before. Uh, he he's going to be on the show. Um, I, I I've got a couple of other filmmakers I'm excited to have on. So uh, just stay tuned for that. I'm not at a place yet where I think I can do it every week. But the goal, the goal with this show, is to either have a guest on for the full episode. Excuse me, or. If they're a call-in, like a pre-recorded thing, maybe do a first half uh, with just me sort of talking about some stuff I would normally talk about, second half with the guests. We're going to see where that goes. You guys got any ideas? You're, you're a small audience right now, but you're a loyal audience. Let me know what you want. Um, that's the kind of content I want to make, so let me know what you want me to... If you got any questions for Gino, like I said, if you're still listening, you're on YouTube, you got any questions for Gino, shoot them to me in a comment. I will read them. 
I might ask him. <laughs> it depends on what the question is. I definitely wouldn't ask him some of the questions you, you people ask me. Uh, but that is what's coming up. I should be a great show next week. Cannot wait. Thank you so much for listening to me ramble for an hour. But uh, I really appreciate all the listeners. Uh, I'm going to keep making this show as long as you keep listening to it. But you will hear me on the next one.